welcome back. This is the second video in our series about diffusion image filtering. Uh, and in this video, I start with a first. I first start with a quick recap of what we did in the first video. If you remember, there, what we did was we set up the heat equation with the dish layer boundary conditions requiring the field to be zero at the points x equals zero and x equals one. We start with this we started with this configuration at t equals zero, the blue one, and we solved it numerically using the fast Fourier transform and we obtained the configuration of the field that the, all these time intervals you see that it, it is decaying, right? And now in this video the idea is that we're going to talk about Fourier analysis, it will be a more theoretical video and we're going to formalize and justify the things that we did in the first one, right? So without further ado, let us start. Fourier analysis and we again, the same, same as before, we have the one-dimensional heat equation, we have del u del t equals d del square u del x square and again we want to solve it for a known field at t equals zero which we're going to call f of x right but now instead of requiring it to vanish at some points zero and l we're going to require that the limit of both u and its spatial derivative falls off to zero at plus and minus infinity so you can think of it as you have this if we have here the x uh, and here u, we can think that the field something like this, right? And it with it falls off at infinity. It is still a positive, very small value, but will eventually become smaller and smaller as x as the absolute value of x grows larger, right? And when we impose these conditions we can see that the total amount of field if I integrate uh, u x t over all of the space dx and when I take the time derivative what uh, we eventually get from the algebra is that uh, this depends on the derivatives at the extremes then it's just zero so since the, the time derivative of this is zero we have that this integral is constant which, which means, means that the, the amount of field uh, the, the total, total amount of field remains the same and I can imagine okay so why did this not happen in our first example right you see here clearly that the amount of field is diminishing. Well, it turns out that this is because of the boundary conditions, right? Because when we solve the problem with the Richelieu boundary conditions, we are saying that the derivative of at x equals 0 and at x equals 1 can be anything that we want. And we see that when we calculate the, this, the time derivative of this integral, it depends on the derivative at the extremes. So if, for example, we solve the problem with Neumann boundary conditions when we require that the derivative is the derivative is zero and not the value of the function, then we would see this total amount of field conserving, right? But the, for, the, for our choice of boundary conditions in the, the first vision, that does not happen. All right. And you see that we did some separation of variables to solve this, uh, the first uh, video, but to solve with these ones we actually need something called the Fourier transform, and to motivate it we have, we introduced the Gaussian, probably people already know from probability theory, it is this function 1 over sigma square root of 2 pi, exponential of minus x square times 2 sigma square, and the sigma is called the standard deviation of the Gaussian, and uh, if we can see, well, pretend that this is symmetrical, but uh, we have that sigma here and sigma here, and uh, this normalization here is essentially chosen to make this integral equal to 1. Uh, this is an identity. The derivation of it is pretty interesting. You can look, up to, uh, look it up on the internet, but we don't have time to derive it here. But the sigma 
uh, don't trust me on these exact numbers, I might be getting something wrong, but the sigma that is chosen so that this interval is around 67%, right? of the total probability distribution. And if I'm not mistaken, if we pick two sigma, it will be 90% and three sigma, 95%. I, again, don't trust me on these numbers. <laughs> I don't, uh, I'm just trying to remember them, but uh, this, but the idea is that the sigma gives like, uh, as a measure of the width of the Gaussian. When it's large, it is like a very fat uh, distribution. And when, it is small, it's a very thin and localized distribution. All right, and we also define the direct de delta function, which can be thought of as a Gaussian of zero standard deviation, so, or else the delta of x is the limit as sigma goes to zero of f sigma of x. Okay, so if we go back here, you can imagine that as we make sigma smaller, so the, the integral has to be 1 for every sigma, right? So if we make this Gaussian smaller, you see that it will be more, the peak at 0 will be more and more concentrated. So if we make it even smaller, it will be something like this, right? And then you can perhaps imagine that there will be some limit for sigma equals 0 that everything is concentrated at 0. And this is what we call the direct delta function would denote delta of x, right? This is the direct delta. It's a function that is zero outside of of zero, and at zero it is infinite, and this is an infinite that is when you integrate over it, it is given it gives one, right? The the main definition is here is that the integral of a to b of delta x dx is one if zero is contained in the a b interval and zero if zero is not contained. And uh, well, we will not discuss the extreme when zero is an extreme of the interval, which is not really that important for this lecture. But well, the other identity that we're gonna check is this one, that the integral of minus infinity to infinity of f y delta x minus y dy equals just f of x. So it might be better to erase everything here, so let's erase this. Okay, and then we just, let's just draw, let's just put Y here, I know the choice of letter, oh, I know the choice of letter is weird, but save that, and then this Let's say that this function here is f of y, okay? And then, what is delta x minus y? Well, we could write it delta y minus x. The delta function is even. It makes no choice designing inside there. It makes no difference. But, well, this delta x is just, just if we mark a point x here okay and we pick this is just delta x minus y okay and you can imagine if when we integrate this since this is like zero outside none of the values outside of this point, none of the values of f outside of this point x really matter, only the value of f at x matters, and then when you integrate, it is just this thing that gets picked up, which is just f of x, right? And this is all that this identity is saying. But the thing is, uh, we... If you remember from the last video, we kind of hinted at the convolution, and the convolution of two functions uh, is defined as the integral of minus infinity to infinity of f, y, g, x, minus y, d, y. And then if we interpret this identity in light of this, what this is saying is that the convolution of f with the delta function is f itself. So you can understand the direct delta function as the identity of the convolution operation, right? So you, if you conv 
if you do the convolution of any function with the direct delta, you get the function itself, right? Cool. And then there's like this, another identity that's like very, very important, which is the integral of minus infinity to infinity is of the exponential of minus i k x dx equals 2 pi delta of k, right? So if there are two parameters here, k and x, when we integrate uh, x out, it's only only k remains and this function of k that remains is exactly 2 pi delta k now this integral is like a bit uh, there's like some tricks to evaluate it again I I encourage you to look at it the, the integrals that they that I'm showing in this video they might look intimidating but after a while they get pretty easy so and I really recommend you to at least once in your life look at how they are done. It's like very, very useful knowledge and uh, sometimes it's like learning how to ride a bike. You never forget it and it's fun. All right. So in any case, the idea here is that we add this parameter lambda, we kind of modify this function to make it converge. And then we add this minus x squared lambda squared divided by two dependency, uh, and um, we reduce it to this integral. And this there are some other tricks. It's called uh, differentiation under the integral sign. I'm not going into details, but when you do that, you will see that uh, it gives this square root of two pi divided by lambda exponential of minus x squared to lambda squared. This is almost a Gaussian with uh, standard deviation lambda. The only difference if we look from the definition is that here the square root of pi is in the denominator. Here it's in the numerator. But uh, yeah, so we can fix this and say that this is like 2 pi times a Gaussian. And then when we take the limit lambda going to 0, this is just a Gaussian of lambda will go to zero and then this, this is just the delta, delta function here, right? right? So, so this is more or less a, a sketch of the proof of this identity. All right, and once we have this machinery, we can now introduce the Fourier transform. So what is the Fourier transform? So we have capital F of K, the Fourier transform of F of X, is defined as the integral of minus uh, infinite to infinite of f of x e to minus i k x and the interesting is that doing a very similar operation we can re get back f of x so if we integrate minus infinite to infinite of uh, large f of k e i k x with a plus sign not a minus one and we here we substitute the definition of f and then we apply all those identities from before and we see that we have 2 pi f of x so this and then this gives us the inverse for here transform f of x equals 1 over 2 pi integral of minus infinity to infinity large f of k e i k x dk so you see that i kind of introduced all those identities to justify this 2 pi factor in the inverse for here transform the rigorous proof you had to go for the derivation of all those integrals to see where this factor of 2 pi is coming from but I like at least to give an idea where it's coming from instead of like just putting the formula right okay and the Fourier transform has two very important pro properties that will allow us to solve the problem the first one is that if we calculate the, the convolution of two things here f star g given by this formula if we take the Fourier transform of this then we see that in Fourier space the, the Fourier transform of these guys are just one multiplied by the other the pointwise multiplication and this formula is just that if we take h k and we put hx equals the convolution and we have like this rather long derivation to see that it is just f of k g of k and the other property which is also an amazing one is that 
the derivative of a function in real space corresponds to just multiplying the Fourier transform of the original function by ik. And the proof here is pretty simple. It is just integration by parts with a vanishing boundary term. And yeah. So this is a lot of formalism that I went by very fast. But the advantage of introducing all of this is when we put all these operations, the, the problem kind of solves itself, right? So if you do the heat equation in Fourier space, so we, we, it is very simple. We simply take this equation here and calculate the Fourier transform only on the x side. The t remains the same. And in Fourier space, it just says that del u del t k of t equals minus d k square u k of u k and t. Right, you can see that the derivative is like ik, and we had two x derivatives, so we have ik squared, and i squared is minus one, so we have this thing. And this is just an OD, this is actually very simple to solve. The solution is just u of k and t equals u of k and zero exponential minus d k squared t. And then we see something like completely analogous to the last problem. So what we did in the first video is that we took the fast Fourier transform, not not exactly the same thing as this continuous Fourier transform, and we saw that we obtained the evolution by just multiplying by something like uh, k squared t, right? So, and then when we transform back, uh, and then like in the previous problem we saw that this solution was the original signal. Uh, uh, and the, conv the convolution of it with another thing. And here we can actually calculate what this signal is, that we call it k, and we simply full here transform back this exp of minus dk square t thing. And if we do, like it is an, uh, the derivation is pretty similar to this integral here. Again, if you it's pretty much just some chain, some renaming of parameters, really. Again, if you have never done this in your life, I highly recommend you to do it. But uh, if you actually compute, you see that this k of x t, which is called the kernel or the Hilt kernel or the propagator or whatever, is just one over two square root of pi dt uh, exponential of minus x square f over four dt. And if you substitute this formula in the Gaussian, you see that this is a, just a Gaussian with a standard deviation of sigma equals the square root of 2 dt. So once we have this function, look at how interesting this is. We can express the, sol the solution of the heat equation as just a convolution with this k. We have u of xt equals the convolution of u y0 times k x minus y t dy. And now another thing that's like very very interesting is what if our initial field configuration is the direct delta, right? And then we see that the evolution is the kernel. So this this is actually a very very powerful result. So what is this uh, k of x t thing. It has like several meanings. So you can understand that this function, if we go back to Krita, so let us erase all of this. So if we draw, okay, here we have t and x. What, what, out, what we derived there is saying that if we start here with a Dirac delta function, at t equals zero, okay. Once we go to a time t. Okay, now let us call this t, right, then x. At a time t, this delta function will have transformed into a Gaussian, right? 
and the standard deviation of the, it will be still be centered at zero and the standard deviation of this Gaussian would be square root of 2 dt okay and now you can like make yourself this question what what would happen if I for example had I don't know two delta x at t equals zero well the solution would be also a Gaussian but now oh uh, uh, sorry here this is actually x minus x zero okay and this is x zero and the solution here would also be a Gaussian but now it would be centered at x zero the variance would be the same okay but the amplitude would be twice as large right so this will be 2a if this here is a so what essentially what we are seeing here is that from and from the linearity of the heat equation we see what if the signal is this red plus this green one what is the evolution at at a time t well it's simply the blue plus the yellow right and then this is like very very beautiful if you think about it so what all of this formalism is saying is that if you have oh, a, a function, function f, f okay you have f you can think of this f as some sort of uh, sum of Dirac delta functions right And you can imagine that at a time t, these delta functions will spread out and become Gaussians. And you need to sum all of them. If, when you sum all of these things, then you have the solution for the heat equation at a time t. This is actually a very interesting interpretation. Another interpretation that you can have is that if you have a signal okay so and now a completely different interpretation is that if you have a signal f uh, let us maybe do it a bit more weird and the when you pass it through the heat equation at a time t you have the convolution with a Gaussian right and what this is saying is that uh, when you do the convolution if you like place the Gaussian here right oh, my drawing was not good but what is saying that this guy at this position is a weighted average of the guy at this position of the guy at this position and at this position and this position and this position with a weight given by this Gaussian right so we can see from this and this is actually the main objective of this talk is to show you that this k of xt this propagate the kernel kind of contains all the information that you need to do the evolution by the linear heat equation right and there are several ways to interpret it and all of them useful in some way all right okay now if we go back to discrete frequencies because if you recall we solved 
our problem in the first video using the fast Fourier transform, which is something completely different from this continuous Fourier transform. So why I'm showing it to you? Well, it turns out you can imagine that well, what happens, when does the discrete Fourier trans transform arise exactly? The discrete Fourier transform arises when we solve a periodic problem, okay? So we have functions minus L, L, and the boundary conditions that we want to impose is that uh, the, our function f has to be periodic here, so in sense here, and then pretend that these points are the same, right? So uh, here and here, and this repeats itself through all the real axes. This is the situation that discrete Fourier transform arises. The right formula is here, right? So that u at minus l at t equals u l t, and the derivatives are also the same. And if you remember in the first video, there was a step where we substitute where we did separation of variables when we substituted the function of x, and then we substituted this x of x equals a cosine kx plus b sine kx and the conclusion was that the cosine vanished and k had to be of the form n, n pi divided by l, right? If we do the substitution with these uh, boundary conditions what we find instead is that yes, k equals n pi divided by l but the cosine terms no longer vanish they contribute just as well as the sine ones do. So when we want to expand our f, we have, well, usually se we separate this term a0 because it's like cosine of 0, which is 1, and since sine of 0 is 0, there isn't an equivalent b0, just a detail. But now when we sum this series from n equals 1 to infinity, we have both cosine terms and sine terms, right? Very interesting. And you remember that we could like recover these coefficients because of an integral identity, which is like very similar to this one, but the integral is from 0 to L, here it's from minus L to L. But it turns out that this miracle, this orthogonality of the identities, they also happen between sines and cosines. So if we integrate the product of sines n and m with in the interval of minus L to L, they are L when the integers are the same, and 0 when they're different, and for the product of cosine is the same, and for the product of sine and cosine they are always 0. And because of this trick, so when we, if, if we evaluate the integral with a complex exponential, if you think in terms of Euler's identity, oh, here should be minus, I will fix this. If you think in terms of Euler's identity, this uh, we have here an integral for the cosine term and an integral for the sine term all right and so if we put this cn this complex number thing we can just write it in a more convenient way all right and because of this you can you can think of course that uh, uh, and then so if this L is very, very large. You see that L is like going to infinity or equivalent that time is very short. It shouldn't really matter if you're using periodic boundary conditions or continuous ones, right? Because, well, everything is like well localized. So a signal is very well localized at the center and L is very large. So this solution that we found in continuum is also is still pretty useful. And now, which is like the very interesting thing, so we, so when we got for for uh, evolution with respect to the heat equation, equation we, we saw that these things are, we want to compute the next value, we should look at the value itself and the values below it, right? The values close to it. But if our Gaussian is very, very localized, you might see that we might only need to look at 
points that are really really close the points that are very far away will not matter that much and with the formula that we derived we can actually put it so if we sample the interval L with large n we want the square root of 2 dt is approximately equal to L divided by n equals to delta x so Oh, and the idea is that for time evolutions, that's are more or less delta x squared divided by 2d, and delta x are simply an interval, we, we should expect that uh, this Gaussian, the, this nearest neighbor's approximation is accurate, right? And that is the main result of this video, that if you want to approximate by only looking at your nearest neighbors, from this theoretical argument, we should expect that it starts to be valid around at this time scale, right? Okay, and now for the final point, so we saw here that, so why did we, when given this light of the fast Fourier transform, why did we, if you recall, we completed our signal in So when we use the fast Fourier transform, to solve the problem, we use an odd signal, right? We did something like this. And, and the question is why? So, well, if you look at this expansion, it becomes very clear because there are cosine terms and sine terms and that's at that situation we wanted only sine terms right and it turns out that when the function is odd you only get signs because the signs they are all odd you can see that signs are like this right so they are you can see something like this all of the signs are odd functions in contrast, cosines are even, so this, this is a cosine, for example, this is a valid cosine, okay? So if we wanted cosine expansion, we should complete it with an even function. And then when we do this, we actually solve the problem with Neumann boundary conditions. So if we look at our code, to complete with an even function is very simple, I just need to remove that character, all right? And uh, when we remove that character, we actually solve for a different boundary condition when we, we are completing with an even signal, and we solve for Neumann boundary conditions, and uh, in these conditions, the, the field does conserve inside the segment. And if we run this thing, you see, look at this. It is now, the derivative now is staying always at zero, we use only cosines, and you see it filling up. Now the field is conserving because this is what Neumann boundary conditions does. So, you see how powerful this Fourier transform formalism is? You see we could solve it for two very different boundary conditions with only some trivial modifications, and the most uh, important result, I think, from this talk is this last one that if you want to approximate the evolution for uh, for the for uh, small times with nearest neighbors, your time must be more or less of this range. This is the, your, the this is what this all this Gaussian analysis tells us. All right, this has been a very theoretical talk. Not to, um, we only had like. A, a very simple programming result at the end, but I think all this theory is very useful and uh, now that we have all of this in place, in the next video we're going to start studying approximation methods for the heat equation, we will apply everything that we learned. So, bye bye!